Ellen on politics. Have you ever wondered why the bankers from the largest private banks are becoming wealthier and the rest of us are not? takes a working man to save five thousand dollars just remember this mr potter that this rabble you're talking about they do most of the working and paying and living and dying in this community welcome to allen on politics and you just heard canned heat performing a little of let's work together which is the aim of this show i want to work together with other people to address many of the social ills that we have by looking at our social system, particularly the economic and political aspects of it, to see where they may have gone wrong and how we can improve upon them. We begin working together by thinking together. I'm presenting my views for your reflection and testing against your own way of thinking about these things. And then we can talk together when you leave comments for me in response to my views. You can leave comments on either the Allen on Politics YouTube channel or Facebook page. And then finally, finding areas that we can actually work on to advance toward our um, increasingly, I hope, common vision of where we need to go. I do appreciate you viewing this, giving it your attention, likes, shares, and comments. And I had a comment last week from somebody, uh, a listener, a friend actually, again, a different friend this time, who said that in my last episode, I was not too clear what I was trying to say about bonds as a way to expand the concerns, the social concerns uh, at stake when we make, um, when our society makes investment decisions. And looking back, I wasn't very clear for several reasons, but I think one of them is simply my uh, deficiencies as a presenter. Yeah, and it's made worse by the fact that I'm pretending to talk to human beings, but actually I'm staring into the lens of a camera that gives me no human reaction. So sometimes it causes my brain to hiccup a little bit and I don't quite say exactly what I want to say or leave important pieces out. Please have patience with that part of it. But also because I've been presenting my views in a piecemeal form and haven't always given a, a, an insight or an overview of how all these pieces fit together. In this episode, I'd like to do two things. First, I'd like to give an overview of what I've been presenting because in the second part, I want to talk about public banking and credit unions as the final essential piece of what I'm trying to say in, in a vision of a different way of organizing our society. So let me give an overview by starting with my view, very um, simplified, of U.S. history. I talked in earlier episodes about the founding of the Constitution and how the, the people who wrote it we're trying to not only give a greater role to the people as against, you know, monarchs and royalty trying to control society. This was supposed to be a government of the people, but also protecting property rights of the elite by blockages meant to slow down the formation of democratic majorities. Now, I don't share their suspicion of democracy. I do believe you need to have ways of... Um, voting and, and having democratic rule that do ensure that the people have access to good information and are able to uh, talk about and discuss public affairs to broaden their views and put a check on each other, kind of what I'm trying to do with this show. But I don't think protecting property rights at the expense of people uh, making democratic decisions was the right way to go for a number of reasons that I presented earlier. First of all, their justification of property rights was not very sound. I think the best justification is the how private property rights might increase our general social welfare. And there I think the best argument was simply that it, um, it does tend to protect people from an oppressive government, which they were trying to do by splitting up the government into small parts. There, I think, you know, the best part of the Constitution was really the Bill of Rights and not the separation of powers stuff. And if I if I were to be able to do it all over again, I'd say get rid of the Senate because it's a very undemocratic uh, institution and we don't need bicameral legislatures. But that aside, I think we need to strengthen democracy um, and, and so that people can make better decisions about uh, property rights. And I, I think where they went wrong also with property rights 
was that their conception of property rights extended to property and human beings. Now, that, I don't need to belabor that point because I think we recognize today that slavery was wrong, but there's still an aspect of that that's accepted even today, which is that you can own property in a business organization. And that's what a corporation is, is some investors owning the activity of other human beings. Now, you might tend to think of this in terms of they own the assets of the corporation, but really they can also treat the laborers as assets, um, decide exactly how they're going to be utilized and disregard their own, the, the workers' judgments and how the production process is being done and what they're being asked to do. And um, essentially, uh, looking at it as not a, an organization of human beings working together, but as something that can be owned. I think what they do contribute is finances, and that can be better done in the ways I talked about last week and I'm going to talk about later today. So American history was, um, I mean, the U.S. Constitution was amenable to capitalism because of this protection of private property rights and this idea that you could own work organizations. And uh, it did succeed in um, trying to organize production and apply technology to production in ways that increased wealth of our society. But it wasn't too good at spreading that wealth among everybody and um, protecting us from the negative consequences of it, capitalism, such as uh, strife between uh, investing class and a working class and uh, uh, the, the persistence of poverty in such a, a, a much better off society, um, and, and especially our environmental degradation because businesses, private businesses can offset their costs, the, the negative uh, consequences onto the general public. And we see this most especially in climate change. Now, I would say that um, even though capitalism was beneficial in increasing the overall wealth, of society, we are at a point now where the negative consequences have really caught up to us because not long ago, we we had the kind of um, technological and human and natural resources where everybody could have a decent standard of living. And the main reasons that we didn't was not only maldistribution, that is a very, very wealthy class getting most of the benefit of this uh, of these economic arrangements, but also because we wasted so much money on military, which is a whole nother story that I hope to get to in a, another show. But now climate change is degrading the very natural resources that we depend upon for life. Drought is ruining the land that we grew crops on and that we depend upon to eat. And it's also uh, destroying infrastructure, uh, buildings with uh, floods and wildfires and also killing human beings and making our life more miserable in general. The consequences for neglect of environmental concerns have been very serious, and we now need to rethink where we're headed. Well, the original attempts to deal with this was through regulating business activities and redistributing, redistributing uh, incomes uh, to some extent. But because they don't address the central problem of capitalism, they haven't always worked well. And capitalism has always strained against these restraints by government. And, and actually, once we built up a good regulatory and social welfare state, uh, it, it kind of fell apart because capitalism strained against it. That, that search for profits uh, created an investing class that was against any government intervention, even at the cost of ruining our habitable environment. Um, I think you need to go deeper than that. So the progressive and social democratic reforms are a good idea, but they don't go far enough. The kind of pro the pro program that I'm presenting is one in which, first of all, property rights are balanced against ensuring that everybody have an, has enough access to um, natural resources to survive in a standard that's appropriate to the, the level of wealth of our society, which would mean at least two things in my mind. One would be a universal basic income, which I talked about before and which I want to go more in depth about. And the other would be universal health care, which is talked about a lot already in the public sphere. So I don't know that I need to say a lot about it. I just think it's different from other kinds of social welfare programs because you need to have a, a large risk pool for, for um, health insurance to work the way it should. Universal 
uh, basic income and universal health insurance like Medicare for all are both important. And to get there, we need to strengthen democracy so people can actually be asking for the kind of things they want instead of simply protecting property rights that buttress capitalism. There, to reform democracy, I presented the idea of uh, changing our voting methods, which I think is the essential first step to any of this, and preferring star voting among the many types of voting method reforms that are out there. I talked about that a little in previous shows. I'm going to talk about it more in further episodes, as well as fill out a theory of democracy in a little more detail. And then the final piece is more difficult. That is changing the basis of our economic system. Last episode, I talked a little bit about having employees, that is workers, managing the businesses that they work in in order to reduce the profit incentive and introduce more human concerns about our living conditions, our working conditions, and what we're doing with the assets we have to work with, and to change the uh, investment, the ways that we aggregate investment capital and allocate it by having a public banking system and credit unions, which I'll talk about a little later in this episode. That's how I see this fitting together. We need to go beyond simply uh, progressive uh, democratic socialist reforms that simply work around capitalism to change the heart of capitalism in a way that um, plays down the profit incentive and brings up these other social concerns. First of all, greater democracy through something like star voting. Um, then ensuring people's survival through universal basic income and universal health insurance. And then finally addressing this profit motive by giving control of the workplace over to workers and finding ways to aggregate capital in order to allocate it in a more socially beneficial way. All day long they work so hard till the sun is going down. Working on them highways and byways and wearing, wearing no frown. You hear the moaning, the lights away, and then you hear somebody say, That's the sound of the men working on the chain. Yeah. That musical piece was Chain Gang, as performed by Sally and the Seagulls. Before I move on to the topic of public banking and credit unions and their role in this big picture, I want to continue this overview of things I've already covered by returning to the topic of workers' control and bonds that I discussed in my last episode, and which was unclear to that one viewer. Now, I failed to clearly distinguish two aspects of decisions about, uh, about how businesses operate. One set of decisions would be made internal to the business, and the other set of decisions are made by investors in a, in a business. So right now, we have business organizations that, in which control is in the hands of a board of directors elected by stockholders. And the primary um, concern of most investors is to get a good return on investment. Therefore, that is the mandate given to the board of directors and the board of directors will uh, pursue a good return on investment for investors to the detriment, most likely I would think, of workers' income and compensation or workers' working conditions. In other words, work them harder and use them more efficiently, even if it's detrimental to the worker's health or mental health because of stress, or to concerns about the environment or the role of business activities in um, their effect on the safety of products for consumers, et cetera, et cetera. So that primary incentive to increase a return on investment is going to um, create an incentive to neglect other socially responsible types of uh, concerns. If we give control over to the workers, that would mean the board of directors is instead selected by the workers in a work organization, and they have a different set of concerns. Of course, they are going to be very concerned about working conditions. So that is automatically boosted up in the scale of things. And instead of pursuing a better return on investment, they're simply going to be concerned about repaying 
loans because without stockholders, the only way to get capitalization would be through loans or um, selling bonds. Their concern is going to be to repay those loans, repay those bonds, and pay the interest in order to keep their credit rating good. They will get a larger share of the income than if some owners were trying to increase their profits at the expense of workers' share of the income. So there should be a better distribution overall across the economy as workers get a better share. And investors get probably a lesser share because they can't extract so much profit. They have to be content with market interest rates depending on risk. Also, workers are closer to the internal decision making of companies, especially when they run them. They know what the business is doing and how it may be affecting the outside world. Insofar as they have concerns about their community, about the environmental impact in their community, things like that, they can incorporate these concerns into their decisions about choosing a board of directors and choose a board that holds those in higher priority. Again, it helps to boost social concerns at the possible expense of a higher income for the workers because workers would know more what's going on in the business and they may have their roles as citizens of the community the business is in or other roles in which those concerns can write to the surface. Now on the part of investors, they are going to be looking for a good interest rate and a safe vehicle, but they can't shop around for businesses that are able to extract greater profits to give them a better return. They have to be content with whatever they can get for a similar level of risk in terms of market interest rates. So they can't impose that profit incentive as easily on a business as stockholders could. This is obviously a big change from the way we do things here, and it's not something I would expect to happen immediately, and that a lot of the practical details would be have to worked out by many minds that are, can contribute more than I can. The general picture, though, is it'll you could approach this step by step in an incremental fashion by having government and nonprofit organizations fund research into legal frameworks and accounting procedures for worker-owned businesses, and you could find ways to increase the opportunities of current worker-owned entities like worker co-ops by giving them some kind of uh, subsidies or loans to get off the ground. And right now, government gives a lot of subsidies to companies to pursue particular um, socially important goals. For example, to promote clean energy, government would say in the Green New Deal, give loan guarantees or direct loans or even grants to companies that uh, are in the business of green technologies and, and green energy. They could, the government could also create a preference for companies like that that are worker controlled as well. So there's ways to incrementally move towards creating the proper kind of legal and institutional framework for workers control. But ultimately, I think what it'll take is for the national government to use the interstate commerce powers that they have to regulate um, inter companies involved in interstate commerce to say that any company in interstate contest, any corporation, can only have the incorporation privileges, particularly limited liability, if the business is controlled by its workers. So a corporation controlled by its workers would get limited liability protection, but the federal government would allow businesses that were run by stockholders to have liability of those investors for any decisions made by the corporation that impact detrimentally communities or individuals or even workers. It wouldn't be limited to the amount they invested. It could be extended to their own personal fortunes, which would be a big incentive for people who want to buy stocks to instead switch over to lending to work controlled businesses, but it's a long way off that kind of goal. Maybe there's better ways to get there. I'm open to hearing more from other people and I continue to try to research these kind of things. Another incremental step would be simply trying to reduce financial, um, the profit seeking incentive from current institutions, particularly in the area of banking. And that's why I wanna talk about public banks and credit unions and their role in the banking industry. Money, 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 must be funny in the
rich man's world Money, money, money Always sunny In the rich man's world Aha All the things I could do If I had a little money It's a rich man's world that was a piece from Money, 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 performed by Sarah Collins. I've been presenting this set of policy proposals, and probably the initial ones that I presented are credible because there's, always, there's already strong movements behind them. The movement for alternative voting systems, for universal basic income, for universal health insurance. All these ideas have been around for a while, and interest escalated recently because of various events, particularly presidential campaigns like that of Andrew Yang and Bernie Sanders and the state of Maine adopting ranked choice voting for higher level offices. So all these seem like movements that are gaining attention uh, and moving forward and so they're credible. On the other hand, when I talk about worker control of businesses, that may seem far-fetched, especially the idea that this could become the dominant form of economic organization in, in the United States or any other part of the world. But here I point to the transition from feudalism to capitalism as uh, showing how this could work. At one time, feudalism was just taken for granted as the God-given way that people live. You had social hierarchies and, and different ways of doing business than under capitalism. But with capitalism, first there were small-scale people doing different business practices, and then there was intellectual justification for these practices, such as moving from belief in natural social hierarchies to the idea that all people are created equal, or the idea that pursuing personal profit was a sin, moving to the idea that no, this uh, was a way to benefit all of society. And those are some of the ideas that were established in the founding of the United States. And then finally, there were pushes for political changes and legal changes that would make health capitalism to develop further and finally overthrew the feudal system entirely and put capitalism in its place, which now seems as natural to us today, many of us anyway, as feudalism did back a couple hundred years ago. Same thing with workers' co-ops. It started out with small-scale experiments, such as the so-called utopian socialists of the early 1800s, who experimented with workers' co-ops and started worker co-op movements and then the intellectual justifications for workers' control of industries and that developed within the socialist movement and some of these ideas I've been presenting to you in my series of videos and podcasts. And then finally, you have the uh, movement to change legal systems, to change legal codes, to make it easier for worker co-ops to thrive and um, move toward a system in which they are more prominent and maybe could dominate and overthrow the owner-controlled businesses, that is, uh, investor-controlled businesses. Here in the United States, we do have a worker cooperative movement. It is not highly visible, but they also have a federation, and they've been moving toward legal changes that can help the uh, cooperative movement advance. But a lot of these uh, businesses stay fairly small, and I think the primary reason it's hard for them to advance beyond legal obstacles just to establishing these kind of businesses is that it's hard to get a hold of capital. Now, most investment capital in the United States is held in, a, in the hands of a very small set of people, and they're very well steeped in capitalist ideology and the idea that money should be used to gain the highest possible return on your investment. They're not interested in social goals or worker control. How do, how do these businesses gain enough capital to further develop or get established in the first place now, here's where I think credit unions are a key component of what could take place and help accelerate this. Now, credit unions, you may know, are not, they're banking institutions, but they are not privately run for the profit of investors. They are run for the benefit of the members of the uh, credit union who use its services. Whatever community is defined as that belonging to the credit union, you become a member, you put your deposits in there, and then you can get services like loans. And some credit unions even give out small business loans to get businesses established and help them to develop. So you have here a way of aggregating capital that's outside of the system of for-profit investment um, to some extent, because the financial institutions themselves are not run for a profit, but they are run for the benefit of their members. They don't necessarily include social goals, but they could. Look toward 
the Mondragon cooperatives in Spain, which have used credit unions to advance worker cooperatives. It, it's the Mondragon network first started out with a worker co-op and then they created a credit union that would service the workers and that developed into a uh, practice of using the credit union to fund the establishment of new worker co-ops who were also part of the same network of companies. This has continued to grow and prosper over the years and been so far very resilient. So this is a model of how the credit union practice could be applied to the worker co-op movement and how they could intersect to help develop this. It still leaves the problem of how to incorporate more social concerns into investment decisions because I said in some respects worker co-ops do pursue um, social goals such as development of a community's economy and more fair treatment for workers and possibly even you know concern about the environmental damage done by business to local communities but they are not necessarily incorporated in this so how do we move not only from a system where worker co-ops can thrive and worker controlled businesses can thrive but a system in which investment the aggregation of capital for investment in business is also incorporating social welfare goals Public banks, I think, are the answer here. We had uh, in North Dakota for about 100 years since 1919, North Dakota has had a bank conducted by the, by the state, actually owned by the state, and it takes state funds and then uses them to make loans that would help develop the economic community of North Dakota. It is a model in which funds are aggregated by taxpayers and the monies held by governments, such as not only tax receipts, but various um, fees that they impose on people. So it takes aggregation of capital into a government entity, and government entities, by definition, are supposed to serve a community and all the interests of a community. Voters will decide what public banks are capable of doing. That movement has also advanced because of the passage of a law in California that would allow local governments to set up public banks to service those particular communities. These three things together give me a picture of how these movements could work together towards moving towards something like a fully worker controlled economy that is takes into consideration other social welfare concerns with investments. The worker co-op movement, credit unions, and public banks each have a role in this that I'll try to elaborate in future episodes. That's it for this program and I hope you return next time. Thanks again.